May I speak in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Would be willing to bet that if we went out into the world this afternoon, we could take a survey of the man on the street that we met and find a fair amount of people, whether they were in church this morning or not, that could tell us the basics of this story that we heard in our gospel. Many folks would be able to tell us the story of a son who asks for his inheritance early and then goes off to the big city and spends it all irresponsible and irresponsibly. They could probably tell us the story of that young man's return, including rehearsing his speech, making sure he said all the right words. And they could probably tell us of the extravagant welcome of the father and maybe even the anger of the older brother in the field. I think it's safe to say that the story we heard this morning in the gospel should certainly be counted amongst Jesus' greatest hits. In the 21st century, we may no longer understand sheep, which is a common topic for Jesus' teachings, but we still understand complex family relationships. I think if we went around the room this morning, and don't worry, we're not going to raise hands or take a survey, but I think if we went around the room this morning and reflected on our experience of this story, that many of you could talk about how at various points in your lives you've identified with either the younger son or the older brother or the father standing there waiting to greet the son on his return. Each of us can sort of experience that, right? We've probably had at some point, some time, that we took all of our independence and went and made bad decisions with it, right? And then had to to own up to that and, and come back home. Or we were the good child that stayed home and did what we were supposed to do and watched as the other sibling who did irresponsible things was welcomed back at Christmas time. For some of us, maybe we connect with that overwhelming love that the father shows when he runs out to greet his son, either as parents ourselves greeting children that maybe have gone astray or been away, or even as someone welcoming back a sibling or a family member or a friend after there has been a break in the relationship. Our familiarity with this story and our ability to see ourselves in it can be a little bit dangerous, right? We know the story so well and we can connect it with our own lives so closely that we may miss the complexity and the challenge of the gospel. Usually when we come to one of Jesus' parables, we read them looking for where we are, so where we fit into the story and where God is. So what are we supposed to be learning about God and about ourselves? Preachers throughout church history have made good use of this morning's parables, right? They've pointed to the younger son and his sin of pride and dissolute living to give exciting sermons about repentance, And most Christians easily see themselves in some way in the younger son. They are the sinner gone astray in need of redeeming and are thankful for the welcoming arms of the father. Other preachers have pointed to the sin of the older son. That sin seems to be pride and rigidity, right? Perhaps You didn't have a wild youth and you followed the rules so you can stand there smugly in the field with your arms crossed, angry that your father didn't do this for you. But how we use this parable can be dangerous in that who we cast as these different characters can undo the work of the parable itself by becoming making the parable a tool to divide insiders from outsiders. Other well-intentioned preachers have looked at the younger son and said, well, clearly he represents the Gentiles, or later in church history, the Protestants, or in our own age, the progressives. And other times we cast the older brother, right, as the Jews, right, who were too focused on the law, or Catholics who focused on works righteousness, or conservatives who are too rigid in their faith and are keeping people out of the church, 
Now, in all of our retelling, God always stays the Father, it seems, which then covers up the shortcomings of the Father in the story. Right? The Father in this story indulges the younger son without question. He just gives the money and doesn't give any guidance about what to do with it, or maybe it would be better to wait a little while. The father also seems to forget the older son, right? After welcoming the younger son back home, he doesn't send for his other son to say, come to the party. It's only after the older son hears that something's going on that he learns what has happened. I hope that the God that we worship this morning that does indeed lavish such love as we see with the Father and offers such forgiveness, extends that grace equally amongst everyone, not forgetting anyone. Now the lectionary gives us this story in the season of Lent, and we have historically read it as a story about repentance and forgiveness. But I wonder if there is more for us to learn from the story this morning. And going back to the very beginning, I think helps. Sort of the opening framework that we're given that's kind of a throwaway line that tells us who Jesus is telling the story to. The gospel begins, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. Our parable this morning is part of Jesus' answer to that accusation of welcoming and eating with sinners. It's a pretty long way to answer that, and it's a very complicated story that's not particularly direct in meeting the challenge, but it is an answer none the same about who Jesus chooses to eat dinner with. This week I was part of a training for a formation program that is designed to be offered to people that are either new to the Christian faith or returning to the Christian faith after a long time away. Part of each session includes a discussion of what um, the, the author calls wonderings. And I've been told I say this word funny, and so wonderings as in W-O-N-D-E-R-S, not wanderings. W-A-N, though I think they both work because you do wander and wonder. But there's this discussion of wonderings. And the author makes a point of noting that a wondering is not a question, but it is a statement that invites us to imagine and respond. And so one of the wonderings that we considered in this training was, I wonder who Jesus would call his people. Now, folks gave all sorts of responses. They identified the poor. They identified anybody that was on the margins. They identified the sick. They identified folks that were in church and folks that were out of church. And my response was a little different in that I imagined that Jesus' people are whoever I am currently having difficulties with. That they are the people that in this moment that I would decide should be excluded from Jesus' people. Jesus' people, right, in this story are the younger sons who engage in dissolute living. They are the older son who did everything right and is angry about the welcome that his brother gets. Jesus' people are the father that is doing his best, but in trying to be so loving, he forgets the other son. Jesus' people are everybody that is in the story, and that Jesus' people are also the sinners and the tax collectors and the Pharisees and the scribes. I think the new thing that we can maybe learn from this parable this morning is that we really are all Jesus' people. And that the heart of the Christian life, the heart of being Jesus' people, is finding a way to celebrate that includes everyone. Now, I've been very careful throughout this sermon to not call this parable what we normally call it, right? We normally call this parable the prodigal son, 
And when we call it the prodigal son, we tend to leave ourselves very focused on that younger son and imagine the wild life he had in the city and the emotional response of what being redeemed is like in that moment. Some scholars have tried to take the word prodigal and turn it into something that's not as bad as what it was originally intended, right? They are like, you know, boys will be boys, or it's about lavish spending without respect to cost. There's a book called The Prodigal God that tries to cast the word as a way of understanding God's grace. But the word prodigal means selfish, that you selfishly spend money. You selfishly waste your belongings, right? It is only concerned with the self. And I think it's unfair to call this parable the prodigal son because everybody in this parable is a prodigal. The son is a prodigal because he goes and spends his father's wealth. The father is a prodigal because he so selfishly greets the son that he forgets that he has another. And the older brother is a prodigal is because he selfishly holds on to his place and position of the family and cannot join the celebration. Or at least we don't know if he ever steps inside to do that. I think this parable is maybe a little bit less like what our repentance and redemption looks like with God and more about what it means to be a community that is unprodigal. What it means to be a community that has at the heart of it the celebration of salvation, but that does not do so selfishly. It means to be a church that is not as concerned about whether or not we stay in the same place and have the right sort of people in the pews, but that we are a community that goes out to actively find people to invite into the celebration. It's harder, I think, if we bring it closer this way. To say that this is a parable about how we shape our communities and not a parable about how we decide who is inside and who is outside. But at the end of the day, Jesus is talking about who he invites to have a seat at his table. And every time I am here, when I invite us to communion, I remind myself that this altar is the table of the Lord and not of the church. And our parable and story this morning reminds us that this needs to be a table that is big enough and grand enough for those that are full of faith and that those that are completely faithless. And so this Lent, we need to focus on repentance and forgiveness and redemption, but we also need to remember that part of our job is to celebrate in such an abundant way that folks outside hear what we're doing and they are eager to come and join us. And then we can learn from the Father and be ready to run out and greet them. Because Jesus' people are always the folks that we least want to invite in. Amen.